thinking behind this session, uh, our whole network is church life, church leadership and church planting. So we wanted to cover some themes that uh, we feel are really essential principles for you to outwork in different nations. The principles are the same, the nations will be different, the context will be different, but the principles are the same. And as we've tried to say all the way through so far, we must let Scripture speak for itself and, and uh, let the Scriptures, let the principles of Scripture um, speak so that we then adjust our practice, uh, form our doctrine from the Scriptures rather than us reading into Scripture perhaps what our experience has been or what our church background has been. And that can cause us to, at times, have to really look hard at how we do things, what we believe, and say, well, am I really lining up with Scripture in terms of the, the values and the practice that, uh, that I uh, uh, pursue in, in uh, the church I lead or in the, um, the network that you're part of? So one of the observations I would make looking across the evangelical world generally is that some churches tend to be very strong on the Word of God and um, uh, uh, they're very uh, robust when it comes to the things of the Word of God and, but somehow have little uh, practice or experience or well-formed um, uh, mature expression of allowing the, the manifest presence of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in their contexts. Other churches um, seem to focus quite strongly on the workings of the Holy Spirit, but are somewhat less attentive to uh, having a strong biblical foundation for church life. Now, my uh, plea for us this morning would be to say those two things are not just a matter of, well, that's my churchmanship and this is your churchmanship and God blesses us all together and you're more into the Word of God and you're more into the Spirit of God and that's all part of the rich tapestry of God's wonderful church. Nonsense. That's like saying, well, you can have this bit of truth but you've not bothered with that. Or you can, yeah, I, I have this bit of truth, but I'm not really into that. That, that. That's not letting Scripture shape us. That's letting our preferences or our style or perhaps the, the, the setting we've been brought into as Christians determine uh, our belief and practice. We have to get back to Scripture and say, what is the New Testament flavor? When we read the New Testament, it's not just... Uh, when it comes particularly to the, to the epistles, uh, uh, um, uh, the Acts and the epistles, they are not just uh, descriptive, saying, well, this is just what happened, but it might happen very differently today. No, they're prescriptive. They're giving us principles. They're giving us um, timeless uh, values that we can extract and say, well, we, we actually want this and this because this is what the Scriptures show us. So when I read the Scriptures, I find church life that is founded strongly on the Word of God, there's good doctrine, that Paul is, Paul is very attentive to warding off error, to making sure things are taught well, people are instructed well, there's robust belief and practice, it's, it, it, that's his concern, he wants to make sure all these things are taught well and practiced well in church life, but yet yeah, you also find with Paul, you know, the man who who wrote Romans, you know, the, mo the most extraordinary theological, uh, profound writings that, that people have written commentaries about ever since, just say the extraordinary depth of theological insight. This is also the man who, 
who speaks about, you know, 14 years ago being caught up into the heavens. I don't know whether I was in my body, out my body. I was having mystery encounters with the Spirit. I can't even talk about them. They were so strange. And, and Peter falling into a trance on his roof and getting a vision of, of, uh, that then called him to go to Cornelius. These are men who wrote extraordinary doctrine, but also had extraordinary encounters with the Holy Spirit. And my, my uh, argument for us in terms of trying to recover New Testament uh, patterns of church life is that word and spirit belong together. They belong together. So what I want to do is just to look at a few principles that uh, I've found uh, and, and we've found together as we've journeyed uh, within the, the family of churches, our bigger family of churches, which is called New Frontiers. Um, Relational Mission is one of the, the networks that's part of that. And we've, had to, we've worked strongly over the last 30 plus years just to try diligently to have a church uh, a culture that is strong on the Word of God, but also very open to the manifest presence of God and those two things working together. So I'll start by looking at um, the, uh, the Word of God and how you maybe build a, a good foundation of, of having the Word of God uh, center stage and, and robust within church life. And I think we do need to say, first of all, that you know, we do believe in sola scripture. We do believe that the Bible is our final authority uh, everything is tested against Scripture. Uh, or everything that happens, everything we say, we, uh, our Scripture is sufficient to give us everything we need for uh, our doctrine, for our practice. So we, that's the plumb line. Scripture is the plumb line. And we've got to constantly keep bringing everything in church life and in our own lives up against the Scriptures. What do the Scriptures say? What do the Scriptures say? So we've got to teach our people and as leadership teams... Uh, if you have an eldership team or whatever leadership team structure you have, constantly be looking at the scriptures together. Does our practice match this? Are we teaching well on this? Is there some error in the church we need to adjust? So we, 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 there is a plumb line. There's a scriptural plumb line and we have to be vigilant. There are trends and winds of doctrine and all sorts of flavors that blow through the Christian scene. A good, uh, healthy local church leadership will be those that are attentive to the winds of the, the, the Christian world, and yet just keep the plumb line of Scripture, just keep applying the plumb line of Scripture to everything we believe and practice. I would say personally, uh, it's important for us as leaders and to teach our congregations to be those who are regularly in the Word of God. I'm, I believe in, in meditating on Scripture uh, I, I uh, encourage people, even if you only read one verse a day, just think about it. You know, just feed yourself constantly on the Scriptures. Let the Scriptures be your constant companion. Um, uh, allow the, the Scriptures to be the, the, the food that you, you, you daily um, feed yourself on. Reading, reading good books. Uh, I, I love to read books about the nature and character of God devotional books, some of the great um, uh, commentaries uh, in, at the bookstore here is like wonderful walking around reading some of the tremendous titles there. So reading good, solid theological stuff that warms the heart, not just academic stuff, but devotional uh, things that draw us near to the nature and character of God, reveal the beauty of who God is, I would encourage leaders to be doing that because it feeds your soul, but encourage your congregation to, to be stirred with the themes of Scripture as to who God is, his, his beauty, his wonder, the, the great doctrines, uh, just feeding yourself on these. The songs that we sing, uh, it's important that they are, they're, they're, we, we learn by songs, uh, we learn doctrine, we learn truth, we learn the beauty of who God is from what we sing. So it's, a, it's important to give attention to these things. Uh, I would say that teaching the whole counsel of God in church life is important. One of the things that we tend to do as churches is we would do preaching series that would go through a whole book of the Bible. 
Uh, and we just then go through, when we finish that, we go through another book, and we go through another book. Now, sometimes we will have special topics, or we will have themed preaching series, but most of the time, uh, we found it helpful, over the years, we found it most helpful to, to go through a book of the Bible, and that way you've, you end up having to preach on everything that's in the Bible. So, in my home church, we're going through Hebrews at the moment, I think we're up to about Hebrews 13, we've been doing that, and uh, it means you have to deal with some chapters you'd rather wish someone else was on the road to for that week. So you have to get into Hebrews 6 and try and figure that one out and think, oh goodness, this is complicated. So, but it's good because it then teaches the church to, if you expose a church to expository preaching, you will produce a church that thinks in an expository uh, way. So you train, you train people to be strong in the word, to be able to test and discern for themselves truth from error. It, it teaches people to be able to let scripture speak for itself. So expository preaching is, is vital. It's a diet of the church. And uh, you want to you know, have that as a strong, regular component, weekly component of all we do. Next, I would say it's important that we, uh, um, we teach beyond our experience. Now, what I mean by that is uh, if we read something in the Scripture and we think, well, right, it's my turn to preach, and it talk, it's talking about, you know, a particular thing, and you think, well, I've not experienced that, what do I do? Well, you still preach it. You preach it. You might even preach yourself into experiencing it. Uh, it's really important that we do that because then we're not submitting Scripture to our experience, we're submitting our experience to Scripture. And sometimes we can preach that in such a way and be honest to the congregation and say, you know, I've got limited experience of this, but this is what the Bible is saying, so I'm thirsty for this, I'm hungry for this. And it actually helps the congregation to think, yeah, if you're thirsty for it, I'm thirsty for that. We, we want these things. We want to learn what this is. So be, being a church that's built on the Word of God means we preach beyond our experience. We let our experience and our thoughts be governed by the principles in Scripture. I think it's also important to say, uh, and I come from a sort of a conservative evangelical background, that we don't worship the Bible, we worship the God of the Bible. And I would say that perhaps growing up, I, I came across Christians who were so, um, so strong on the Word of God, it almost, to be honest, it almost became a bit of an idol, that you end up almost worshipping the, the, the diligent nitpicking of this and that, that you miss the God it's talking about. It's, we are not in love with the Bible, we are in love with Jesus. The Bible points us to Jesus. The Bible's the, the mirror that shows us what God is like. And it's really important we don't become uh, kind of those who, like, a, like a the Pharisees, who sort of could tell you every tiny little bit, and, but their heart was just so cold and iced over. There was no softness, no kind of uh, affectionate uh, encounter with God. It was all detail and, uh, you know, they could tell you every chapter and verse, but there was no softness of heart to the one who actually the scriptures point to. So we've got to watch that. We don't want to become academic institutions on a Sunday morning. That, that, the church isn't a... The, Christianity isn't a booky religion. It really isn't. Books are helpful, but the majority of the world that know Jesus are oral learners. Uh, and not particularly academic. So if we say, well, acad academia is the, the way that helps us know God. No, it isn't. It's a specialism that some people are gifted in. It's a grace gift. We need academic study. But what we really need is a heart encounter with Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. So we mustn't somehow create some sort of academic um, or theoretical context that we just talk about theoretically what God is like. No, we need to experience Him. We need to encounter the living God. Also, I think in terms of uh, building a church healthily on the Word of God, it's important we recognize the different grace that there is on other people. 
it's possible to disagree with part of someone's theology or their practice. You might think, well, I haven't got much in common with the way they do things or even or much of what they believe, but there is a grace of God on them in this area. And I want to learn from that. I want to learn from someone else's grace, even if I think, well, that bit I don't quite agree with, but this, wow, they've got something there that God's really entrusted to them. And that's part of being mature as a church, to be able to test and discern and take the good things. And I'm not sure about that bit, but this is good. So just because you say you've learned something from X, Y, or Z, and people say, oh, you're into that, are you? No, I just think they've said something good there that I've learned from. So to be generous in terms of how we, we learn and have a very teachable heart. Um, it's a bit like the story of you know, Naaman having to go and dip in the river. And he said, oh, it's a dirty river. I want to go and dip in my own river. Or sometimes God says, no, go and dip in that river. And you think, well, it's not. I don't like it. It's, it's, it's dirty. No, dip in it. There's healing there. There's something there for you. And so it's good for us to be strong enough to be able to learn from different people's theological perspectives. Um, that, that, I think, doesn't make us wobbly. It makes us uh, strong. And then uh, the other thing I would say in terms of church life, um, this kind of begins to sort of lean into the, the aspect of the Holy Spirit, is if God starts to move in your church in an unusual way, rather than get out the Bible and sort of look for the verse, try to sort of cut it down the moment it starts... I think, whoa, I've not seen that before. Uh, it's a bit like if you're in a garden and you, perhaps you've bought a house, a new house, and you've got a new garden, you don't know what's in the garden. If in the springtime you're out there with your sort of machete and you're thinking, right, I'm going to weed this garden, and the moment a little shoot comes up, you hack it down, think, oh, I'll get rid of that weed, that might be a plant. But if we're too quick, we can, we can cut off something that God is actually, something that's good. So within church life, I would say, let things grow. Let things grow because it's by, it's by their fruit you know whether it's genuine. And for something to fruit, you have to give it time. Now, Often when the Spirit of God moves in a church, he will do very unusual things. And it will make us feel, well, I'm not sure I like this. We need to stop this because it's unusual. No, let it grow and see whether God is in it. If there's obviously something that is happening, you think, well, it's clear from Scripture that shouldn't be happening. Well, adjust it, speak to it, tend it. Don't don't judge things too quickly until they've really revealed the fruit that they're bearing. So let me move on to the, the, the Holy Spirit and, uh, how, and um, try, try to, how do we encourage the manifest presence of God in our midst. And I'll get to this, uh, just go through this five, ten minutes, and then we'll, we'll have some questions just to, to see where, where, your, um, where your thinking is on all of this. So... Just to say straight away, I do believe in the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit. I do believe that all of the gifts of the Spirit are in operation today, just as they were in the New Testament. I don't believe in cessationism. I think it's theologically um, incoherent. And most theologians today, most commentators today, most of those who are commentating on the gifts of the Spirit or the work of the Holy Spirit in church life today agree with that. Even in uh, quite conservative reform circles, many, many, not everyone, but many are now coming to the point where they say, yeah, well, actually, there's nothing in the Bible that says the gifts of the Spirit have stopped. What often happens is we end up in a situation where, well, nobody ever prophesies in our church. We've never seen anybody healed in our church. Therefore, we conclude these things don't happen anymore. Well, perhaps they're not happening because we're not doing them. It's, it's almost like a self-made theology. So if, well, because we haven't experienced it and we're not experiencing it, we say, well, it doesn't happen. But to be honest, for many of us in our churches, we may not be seeing people saved in certain seasons. We don't conclude, well, obviously nobody gets saved anymore, do we? It's just that there's, uh, that's the experience we're having. And I believe that um, 
uh, encounter with the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, are really important for us to grow personally and for churches to um, mature and flourish into the mature expressions of God's family that he wants them to be. Uh, I quite, I'm quite a fan of Tim Keller's description uh, of, as he calls it, intelligent mysticism, which uh, I think is a, is a great phrase, saying, you know, you can be, a, you can be you know, intelligent in the word, but you can also be kind of mystic, thinking, well, now there is, there is this sort of encounter with God that we, should, that we should blend together. And obviously Tim Keller is from a Reformed evangelical perspective, but he's saying, no, there is a, there is a blending of these things. We can be intelligent myst- mystics, as it were. I believe that uh, we should expect to experience encounters with the Holy Spirit personally. I think Scripture gives us illustrations of that happening to people. And everybody's story is different. I've had encounters with the Holy Spirit as I was uh, coming into my Christian life and, and indeed all the way through my Christian life. There are stories I could tell you of when the Holy Spirit has particularly manifest His presence to me in different ways. And that is part of normal Christian life for me uh, because I believe that the Word and the Spirit do flow together. Now, um, next thing to say is... Uh, I have seen error when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. So I would say I've seen uh, over-realized eschatology. In other words, uh, perhaps particularly to do with healing, uh, getting to a point where people have an over-realized eschatology. So they say, well, you know, everybody should be healed. And if you're not healed, well, there's the problem is at your end. God will always heal. And I do believe personally that God does want to heal. I, I do believe that. But I also believe that we are living in the time when the kingdom is now, but the kingdom is not yet. And there is a lot of mystery in between. We live in the now and the not yet. We live, if, we, if, we were ha- if everything was here now, we wouldn't be praying, let your kingdom come. Because if the kingdom's already here, there's nothing to pray for. So we do live in the now and the not yet. And we have to teach carefully into that. So the way I would inc- uh, advocate that is you teach strongly about the kingdom but you teach strongly about healing. You teach about the end times. You teach about the the now and the not yet. You teach about sin and the the fallenness of the world and the kingdom of God breaking in. You teach well from the scriptures and you pray for the sick. You do both. And uh, I've seen countless numbers of people healed uh, over the years in different settings, but I can't say I've seen everybody healed because we live in the tension of the now and the not yet. So I keep praying for people faithfully, regularly, and I do believe that there are seasons when God comes, when surges of healing take place in uh, churches. You can find that. um, I think one of the best examples of word and spirit in the New Testament is Paul in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, where it says for two years he taught. He taught the Bible, the whole of Asia, heard the word, he taught, he taught every day, every day he taught, it's a bit like being here for two years, imagine that, he taught every day, they were all in networks for two days, all of Asia, they heard the word, but it says God did extraordinary miracles through Paul in the same context, so he's teaching the word and then dropping his handkerchief on people and people were getting healed, that's a great example of word and spirit, great theologian teaching the robust doctrines of faith and then throwing his kind of cloth on people who were just happening to uh, be near him and incredible healing taking place. I think that's biblical. It's both together. There's nothing in Scripture to say that those things have stopped. Now, just because someone's teaching something wrong or someone has a practice that wrong, that's wrong or people are teaching error or excess in spiritual things, supernatural Holy Spirit things, doesn't mean we stop it. The answer to abuse isn't non-use, it's proper use. So we have to uh, make sure we have a robust biblical model of practice that we, uh, the answer to something being wrong is we'll do it right, don't not do it at all. (laughs) Many people I find drift to cessationism and having no Holy Spirit activity in the church not out of theological conviction, but they drift into that because something has happened that's either hurt them or made them scared 
or something's gone wrong in their church experience. So they think, well, it's too dangerous, we won't even go there. I don't think that's good leadership because the answer to abuse isn't non-use, it's proper use. So we have to go on that journey. God's entrusted us as leaders to rightly handle the Word of God, to be able to teach well and facilitate the manifest presence of God really well. That's what we've been entrusted with doing. A couple more things. Um, Yeah, I think the, the way that we facilitate the Spirit is not by living by principle alone, but we live by relationship. Many of us can teach the Bible, A, B, C, we can teach things, teach principles, but it's got to have life. It's got to be encounter. I, I want to encounter God, don't you? Every, I want to encounter God. I don't want to talk about Him. I want to encounter Him, the living God. And the Bible, as I say, can become uh, a, bit of, a bit of an idol if we say, well, yeah, we've, we've met with God's Word. No, I don't want to meet with God's Word. I want to meet with God. God's Word helps me to do that. Next, I think it's important we don't prescribe how God might manifest His presence uh, in our midst. The Bible uh, doesn't even describe all the things that God did. When you get to the end of John's Gospel, I love those last few verses of John's Gospel where he's obviously written so much and then he says, Jesus did many other things as well. It's always like, oh, I can't bother. This is too much. Uh, he said, even, if, even all the books in all the world couldn't contain every th- the stories of everything he did. He's kind of exhausted. So uh, Jesus did many other things as well. So there are things that the Bible doesn't tell us that Jesus also did do. There are many things the early church saw that aren't all, all recorded. We, are, we have examples to follow. They're not um, the totality of everything God does. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones gives this sort of illustration. Remember when Jesus healed the blind man uh, and he, he spat on his eyes and healed him. And then on another occasion, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud and put it on uh, another blind man's eyes and both were healed. Martin Lloyd-Jones makes the point that we are so conditioned to legalism that out of those two encounters, what tends to happen in Christian life is you get two camps. You get the Muddites and the anti-Muddites. And people say, no, you can only heal blind people with mud. And others say, no, 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 you don't need mud. You need just spit. And so you end up with these factions because people have only encountered one experience of what God does Now, I just want to say there is a rich tapestry to the movings of the Holy Spirit, and we have to just weigh what happens and observe what happens, but we mustn't be too prescriptive. Most revivals, if you read the history of revivals, any revival in any country is always resisted when it starts, and you know who resists it the most? The church, because usually something happens that's out of our experience, and we think, well, that can't be God because we don't do it that way because there's something in us that likes ritual, legalism, predictability. We have to let God be God. Um, So the last thing I'll just say on this, and then we'll deal with some questions, is uh, I believe, you know, you might say, okay, if I was going to go on that journey and begin to explore how do we have Word and Spirit. What might that look like? How how do I lead a church into the things of the Spirit? Well, I would say give some space in your meetings to see what God does. Um, It might be that you need to go on that journey yourself. Uh, Sometimes even the way we set our meetings up, the chairs even, how we sit sit can can affect things. Um, How much time we give. If our meetings are all timed down to the minute so if God wanted to move well he'd have to find a slot somewhere um that 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 we're not helping him we say well we haven't really felt the presence of God very much well you've organized him out the meeting he can't get in he's uh you know he'll he's on at 11 30 for 10 minutes it's just we've just got to think about these things uh try to teach people that for example if someone prays out in tongues in a meeting and there's no interpretation. Uh, it's not a sin. It's just not very helpful. 
And we get all uptight about gifts of the Spirit. And if someone prophesies and perhaps they, I don't know, don't, don't get their words quite right or... Uh, yeah, we've got to let people learn how to move in the Spirit without it feeling, oh, it's a bit, that wasn't quite right. Or No, when you preached your first sermon, was it perfect? Well, of course not. Well, some of you it might have been, but most of us, our first preach wasn't perfect. But you learn. You learn how to prophesy. You learn how to pray in tongues. You learn how to express the uh, interpretation. You learn how to pray for the sick. You have to let the church uh, learn how to worship, how to move in the power of the Spirit, how to be sensitive to the voice of God. These, these are teaching things. You have to give people space uh, and, and a culture that allows intelligent mistakes. If someone makes an intelligent mistake, they should be applauded for having a go, not, not castigated because it wasn't quite right. The culture we create um, really matters. Managing contributions in the meeting. So in our home church, I'm, I want contributions. I want people to be praying out loud. I want people to be reading scriptures. I want people to be prophesying, praying in tongues. I want... I want people to have words of knowledge about healing. I want that in the, in the meeting. I want, when you come together, everyone has. Everyone has something they're bringing. Now, you don't have time for it all, and you have to teach the church. Look, you might, there might be 10 people who want to prophesy. The Bible in Corinthians talks about, you know, just three, three at a time, and then you kind of weigh it, you, you pause, you don't just have, you know, dozens and dozens of prophetic stuff so nobody can remember what was said at the beginning. No, manage the meeting well. Manage it. Learn how to do it well. Most of these things are journeys of learning that we have to go through.